Okay, so welcome back. Uh, for the last uh, couple of weeks, we've been talking about patent law, or more specifically, we've been talking about utility patent law, or patents over novel inventions and discoveries. In today's class and in, in our next class, we're going to be talking about a different kind of patents, namely design patents. And those are patents that go to ornamental design. And in some respects, they have some similarities to utility patents, arguably maybe superficial similarities, but a lot of ways they're really, really different. And you need to be able to distinguish between the two and understand the difference between the two kinds of patents we're going to be talking about in this in this class because the distinctions are, are, are really are really material and and significant. Okay, so utility patents, as you already know, go to what a prod what a product or process actually does, how it works, what you use it for, you know, what the function of the product or process is. They're what makes it do something. Uh, design patents, by contrast, go to what a product looks like. Right? They protect the ornamental features of an article of manufacture. Now, of course, people buy products because they want a product that's going to work well and do what they want it to do. But people care about how things look, too. And that's what design patents are about. Design patents are about protecting or providing protection for the appearance of a product, uh, typically a product that's being introduced in, in a commercial marketplace. And people care a lot about the products, right? I mean, you, you, know, you can buy any old kind of cell phone, but people want to buy Apple cell phones because they look special, right? They have a unique look to them. And as a consequence, surprise, surprise, Apple has taken out a bunch of different design patents on its cell phone products in order to protect those ornamental design features of, of its cell phones and, and other products. So the appearance of a product really matters. And what we're going to try to do in today's class is just kind of understand the basics of how design patents work and what they're intended to, to accomplish. OK, so as I said, utility patents protect new inventions and discoveries. Design patents protect new ornamental designs, right? So as the design patent element of or the, the kind of the design patent subject matter uh, uh, provision of the Patent Act provides, whoever invents any new original and ornamental design for an article of manufacture may obtain a patent therefore. So in some ways, kind of similar to the way utility patents work. In other words, there's a novelty requirement there, right? The, a design patent application has to be for a new design in order for the patent to issue. It has to be original, whatever that means. Secret is not much. And it has to be ornamental. So it has to be an ornamental design in order for it to be the subject of a design patent. Uh, what that means is it has to be non-functional, right? So a design patent can only protect the ornamental aspects of a product. It can't protect the functional aspects of a product. But determining what the difference between those two things is, is really important. And functional means something specific in the context of design patents, which isn't necessarily intuitive. So you really got to think and understand what we mean when we talk about functionality uh, under the current standard of design patent law. OK, so first off, novelty, right? What do we mean by novelty in the design patent context? Well, at least in theory, uh, the design that's being patented has to actually be a new design. It means it hasn't can't have existed elsewhere in the past. So in theory, we would have the same kind of prior art uh, search that we would have with any other kind of utility patent. And we would look back in time to see if previous designs had been had been patented. Um, unfortunately, the, um, the, the universe of design patents is considerably smaller than the universe of utility patents. And as a consequence, it can be really hard for uh, design patent examiners to locate prior art that they can use to, uh, to exclude or to prevent the patenting of design patent applications. Um, so the reality is that design patents are often really easy to get uh, to issue, even if the design in question 
doesn't really look all that new and is very familiar uh, to anyone who is familiar with the nature of the product in question. Now, the term originality basically hasn't been given, given much of any content, uh, content in a design patent context, so we can almost kind of just ignore it for the purpose of design patent subject matter. Ornamentality is where the, where the meat of this really is, right? So ornamentality is a requirement, but as I said, ornamentality really means not functional, right? So what we're really asking about when we ask about ornamentality is functionality. In other words, is the element of the product that somebody's trying to get a design patent to protect a functional element? And if it's non-functional, well, then it's de facto ornamental. Okay, so a couple different things to uh, article manufacturer ornamental. Uh, okay, so what does a design patent actually look like? Well, there's some really fundamental differences between a design patent and a utility patent. The most profound one is that utility patents claim in words, right? So as you recall, every claim in a utility patent has to be one single sentence, including all of the limitations of, of the claim. By contrast, design patents claim with pictures. Right? So the claim in a design patent is actually an image, not a word, right? Now, historically, traditionally, design patents claim with drawings, right? And we'll look at what some of those drawings look like. That's not obligatory. You could also claim with a photograph or, or any other kind of, of image, right? But it has to be an image of some kind, right? The design patent can only claim with an image. And typically, people claim with a drawing because with a drawing, you can abstract out the elements that you want the design patent to protect. That's hard or impossible to do with a photograph. Now, every design patent will have a title. It's unclear how we should think about the title of a design patent in relation to the subject matter of the design patent. Some people think it's just irrelevant, right? Whatever you call it, doesn't matter. You're claiming in the image and only in the image. And, and when you look at a design patent document, you'll see that there are effectively no words. There's no disclosure. Uh, other than the image that's being claimed. So design patents are, 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 are pretty compact as compared to utility patents. It's just a picture. It's just a claim with the disclosure kind of packed into or baked into the claim that's being claimed in the image. Now, I said, as I said, some people think that the title of a design patent is just irrelevant, right? The, the image is the claim. All you need to look to is the claim. So just look at the image and don't worry about of anything else. Other people think that the the title and the brief description, uh, which is, you know, can be included if you want to, um, should be held to delimit the scope of the claiming. In other words, if you title uh, a design patent in such a way as to point to a particular field of endeavor or uh, commercial manufacturer, then the design that you're claiming should be limited to the context in which the claiming is taking place, right? So there's a little, little bit of question as to whether we should think of the title of the design patent as just irrelevant or as potentially maybe slightly narrowing on the scope of the subject matter of a particular design patent. Now, another thing to remember, and we'll just look at a, a particular, this is a design patent claim right here uh, for what appears to be some kind of uh, muffin man design. And you'll see at the top that it's got the, 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 the patent number is USD. 6109544. So every design patent will begin with the letter D. So if you see the letter D, then you know you're looking at a design patent, not a utility patent. That's a really quick way to tell the difference. Of course, the other way to tell the difference is there won't be any words in the patent. If you don't see any words, then it's it's probably a design patent. If all you see is images, it's probably a design patent. But a great way to know right away if you're looking at a design patent rather than a utility patent is look to see if there's that D there. Because if it's a D, then you're going to have to think about it as a design patent in relation to the requirements for design patent protection, not in relation to the requirements for utility patent protection. Okay, so you've seen what a drawing looks like in a design patent, but there's an additional feature that uh, design patent applicants can use to indicate what parts of the drawing that they want to claim. So essentially what you do is you claim the parts of the drawing that are part of the patent in a solid line, 
but you use dotted lines to provide uh, an indication of the context in which the claimed design exists without actually claiming those those broken line elements, right? So if you see dotted lines or broken lines in a design patent drawing, what that means is that the area or the part of the drawing depicted in broken lines isn't part of what the patent is actually claiming. That's excluded from the patent claim, but it's provided in order, in order for there to be context for the nature of the design patent claim that's being made. So we can look at that in relation to the barbecue grill with pig motif that's included in in the case book, right? So here the claim design is a barbecue in the shape of a pig. And you'll see that the stand for the barbecue is depicted in dotted lines, in broken lines. That means that the stand is not part of the claim design. Only the part that's drawn in solid lines is part of the claim design. And again, on in the, in the design patent document on the left, you'll see that there's some limited description of what's being claimed, right? That's permissible, not not required. Um, and here they're just, you know, indicating what uh, each drawing is is depicting uh, in relation to the product. You will see, in addition, there is a written claim, right? The ornamental design for barbecue grill with pig motif, as shown and described. That doesn't really add anything to barbecue grill with pig motif, the title of the design patent claim. The question is whether that title and description, that claim in words, should be understood as limiting the context of the claim design as well, maybe in the way that the broken line depicted elements could conceivably limit the scope of the design patent by providing some context as, as well. Okay. Well, there's a relatively limited amount of substantive law directed specifically to design patents. Although we might start to see more in the near future as design patents are becoming increasingly significant in, in patent law. Um, there are some, some, you know, some, some substantial difference, substantive differences between design patents and, um, and utility patents. So utility patents last 20 years uh, if they're renewed. Design patents last 15 without any maintenance fees, at least as of recently. So the, the duration is a little bit shorter. The fees are also lower. And the reality is that they're considerably easier to get than, uh, than utility patents are, the, the uh, examination process is uh, less, less rigorous and, and faster. Now, historically, that was understood to be a function of the fact that design patents weren't really seen to really do all that much, right? I mean, for a long time, design patents weren't terribly popular. They weren't seen as providing very extensive protection. And so most people didn't really bother pursuing them. And that's reflected in the number of design patents that were issued, right? I mean, if you look at the number of utility patents, they're in the multi-millions, Right? Whereas when it comes to design patents, we're still uh, in, in the hundred thousands. So a lot, a lot fewer applications being, being filed, um, precise, predominantly because they just weren't seen as providing enough protection to be uh, worth, worth pursuing in many cases. Now, when the federal circuit was created and started uh, reviewing design patent law, it started making it a lot more robust. And I think you'll see how that works in some of the cases that we read for for today's case for today's class how the federal circuit made design patents a lot more attractive right by enabling design patent owners to assert them in a much broader range of circumstances than they were previously able to to raise them um, now for better or for worse right but uh, but there's some additional features which will hopefully come up in in our next class. Among among which is um, a unique feature of design patent protection, which is that uh, one of the potential uh, damage remedies for a design patent owner whose patent has been infringed is all of the profits of the uh, of the infringing product. Um, there's a lot of context surrounding what that means and why that provision was adopted, but it became a big issue uh, in the recent Apple v. Samsung litigation, which actually hinged around design patents, right? So Apple had design patents over certain features of its iPhones, uh, accused Samsung of infringing. And when infringement was found, Apple tried to claim all the profits from Samsung's uh, iPhones. And the question was, you know, is that the right way of thinking about the way this provision works? And the Supreme Court, 
actually kicked it back saying you have to look to the profits that are that are um that are generated by the actually infringing element not the entire product but but just the uh the actual design patent infringement part um okay so let's uh do a really quick run through of how design patent uh doctrine of relating to the scope and uh and ability to claim a design patent changed over time so in 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 ray stevens there was a design patent over the uh the brush in a vacuum cleaner and the question was, was whether or not that was a valid design patent and essentially what it came down to was whether or not that brush could be ornamental or whether it was a functional element of the product and ultimately uh the court which was the predecessor of the uh the federal circuit said no the brush can't be ornamental because you don't see it when the product is in use right in other words it's it's not changing the appearance of the product it's inside the product doing something and therefore it doesn't have an aesthetic uh appeal it doesn't have an aesthetic impact it's not an ornamental feature if it's anything it's a fun it's a functional feature and should be uh should be protected as a utility patent but it's not eligible subject matter for design patent protection uh because it's not part of what you see while the product is in use okay enter the federal circuit and uh there was a design patent on a hip stem prosthesis, right? So this is a, a metal part that is used by surgeons to, uh, to Im implant a hip replacement, right? And so the response was, well, this is also like the, like the circular brush, not an ornamental feature of, uh, or rather the, it's, it's not a, a design patent or it can't be a design patent subject matter because you better not be seeing a hip uh, pr prosthesis uh, while the product's in use or else you're in real trouble, right? I mean, that's inside someone's body. You don't want to be seeing that. And the response was, well, for the federal circuit says, well, we don't just, you know, that doesn't just mean when it's actually implanted, right? They could have an aesthetic appeal at any time, right? And these hip prostheses look different, right? And maybe different appearing hip prostheses could be important in the sale of the hip prosthesis, even if uh, it doesn't matter in the actual use of the hip prosthesis. So in other words, it, it can be ornamental if the appearance matters at any point in the lifespan of the product, even if it doesn't matter when the product is, is actually being is actually being used. Now, query whether that's the right approach to thinking about ornamentality and specifically in relation to hip prostheses, right? I mean, you know, assuming that doctors have aesthetic opinions about, you know, which hip prostheses are more aesthetically appealing, um, do you, should you want doctors making their decision which prosthesis to buy based on its aesthetic appeal rather than its, uh, its actual uh, effectiveness? It seems like the answer has got to be no there. Um, so maybe at least in this particular case, that was a little unwise or at least something to be wary of. Um, further question though is like, is that the way we want to think about it or, uh, uh, about uh, ornamentality and functionality or, or should we think about functionality and ornamentality in the actual use of the product as intended, as opposed to, you know, when the product is put on sale for a uh, interim purchaser, as it were, right? So, you know, do we want to give ornamentality this kind of highly formalistic content in the sense of like, well, if it's ever ornamental or ever conceivably ornamental, then it's potentially design patent subject matter. Or should we think about it more narrowly such that, you know, this is an appropriate uh, uh, point at which to have an aesthetic response to the product in, in question. Okay. So, kind of defining case uh, at the moment when it comes to uh, well, one of the defining cases at the moment when it comes to functionality is the Roscoe v. Miro Light case. And that involved a, uh, a design patent on an oval shaped mirror used on school buses. And uh, Roscoe uh, owns a design patent on this oval shaped mirror design and alleges that mirror light is infringing on its design patent. Well, mirror light's response is no, this is a functional design. It's a, it's a mirror in the shape of an oval with a, with a dome 
on it. And, uh, and it's in that shape because it's supposed to show you a, a wide range of feel, a wide range of view when you look into it, right? And the idea behind the mirror is you want to see as much, you know, as you possibly can. So you don't run over any little children when you're backing up the school bus. Um, and lower court agrees, says this is a functional design. You know, you can't get a design patent on a design that is, you know, it, it, it's designed this way in order to do what it's supposed to do. The purpose of the product is to show you a wide range of view. That's what an oval shaped mirror of this kind does. Therefore functional, therefore not ornamental, therefore not design patent subject matter. But the federal circuit reverses, right? And it says that's the wrong test to apply for functionality uh, in order to determine whether or not a feature of a product or design of a product can be ornamental, right? The test for functionality is, is there only one way to design the product in order to achieve the goal in question, right? And so the, the, the federal circuit essentially says, unless the function of the product can only be achieved with one design, then the design is not functional, ergo, it's ornamental, right? In other words, the federal circuit simply says, if an element of a design, if the design of a product is not functional in the way that we've, de we've defined it, then it is by definition ornamental precisely because it's not functional. And it says in this particular case, there are alternative designs that would have the same field of view. Therefore, the design of this product is not functional because there's more than one way you could achieve it. Right? Functionality is only if, functionality exists for design patent purposes, if and only if it's the only way to achieve the particular functionality in question. It's a very peculiar definition of functionality, right? Because one would normally think that a oval shaped mirror with a convex surface would be functional in the relevant sense of it, it accomplishes the goal. But the federal circuit says, no, it's only functional and non-ornamental if it's the only way to achieve the goal. And because there's other designs, other shapes that would give the same or similar field of view, not functional, and therefore it is design patent subject matter. Okay. So one other case in a PHG Techs v. St. John's Companies, uh, PHG sells medical labels and St. John's Hospital right? Or rather, St. John's is a, uh, they also sell labels and they're in a, in a similar business, right? So PHG has a design patent over a particular arrangement of labels for uh, these medical uh, bracelets, essentially medical uh, patient identification system, bracelets that you get when you go to, to the hospital. And St. John's starts manufacturing, starts selling a essentially identical uh, layout of uh, of labels on on its own on its own uh, label design and PhD sues on the ground of design patent infringement. St. John says no, this is not a uh, design patent subject matter because the layout is functional, right? Um, and PhD says no, there's many different ways that you could arrange the 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 stickers on the sheet, therefore it can't be functional because there's more than one way to do it, right? I mean, you just said so in, uh, in Roscoe. And uh, you know, district court says, yeah, that's what the federal circuit said, right? As long as there's more than one way, then it can't be functional. So it's not functional, it's ornamental, therefore it is design patent subject matter, therefore the claim can proceed. Federal circuit actually reverses in this case, right? It says, you gotta do more fact finding right? Because it's not just whether there's more than one way to lay out the stickers on the sheet. It's whether there's more than one way to lay out the stickers on the sheet that's equally effective, right? So the problem here for PHG is that while it's true that the stickers could be laid out in lots of different arrangements, right? St. John's has come in with an argument with evidence saying that this is the best way to lay out the stickers from the from the standpoint of efficiency, right? So the reason the stickers are laid out in this way is that it's the most convenient layout for the people who are dealing with the patients and doing the identification and alternative uh, layout of the stickers, while possible 
would be less good, would be less effective, would be less functional than the layout in question. Therefore, it's functional because it's the best layout, not because it's the only layout. So a slight narrowing of this idea of functionality as being, you know, only if there's only one way to do it. Here, it's only if it's the best way to do it and all the alternatives are inferior.